dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today's topic is Holy Communion and the pandemic. And whether through the reception of communion, one can become sick. The answer is that the body of Christ is holy and has the power to defeat any disease. According to John Damascene in the exact edition of Orthodox Faith, In those who receive Holy Communion with faith and true repentance, the body of the Lord becomes a safeguard for the strength and healing and health of soul and body. Holy Communion does not make people sick because Holy Communion is truly the real body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of life. Let us not forget that this teaching is basic in the Church, which has passed through the history of pandemics much harsher than the one which we pass today. Holy Communion gives the true life. It does not destroy the life, neither the biological nor especially the spiritual. It is a blasphemy to say this, but people in ignorance say it. History presents us with numerous examples of the spiritual and physical healing that accompany reception of the divine gifts. Saint Anthemos of Chios regularly communed lepers and tuberculosis patients. Doctors and scientists told him not to do this because it was a major infection source, especially for himself. Surrounded by the constant pressure of doctors, he, after he communed all these sick people, consumed the holy gifts in front of the open royal doors, so that everyone could see. Everyone said he was going to die in a few days. The saint not only did not die, but lived many years afterwards, having a holy apprentice among them, the saint Nicephorus the leper. Saint Nicephorus recently appeared to one of the students of the Athenian Academy, a seminar under the supervision of Vatipiti Monastery, in the chapel of the Academy and comforted him by telling him that it is in the order of the holy unmercenary healers, and not to be afraid, but to meet all the temptations that will come with faith and patience, and the saint will help. After that, the saint disappeared, leaving behind a very strong relic fragrance. Another example is the pious father Chrysanthos of Spinalonga Island, where he was serving a parish filled with lepers. Not only was Father Chrysanthos regularly consuming the holy gifts after communing all the lepers, but he did this for over ten years, never himself becoming ill. What is more, because access to the island was forbidden, Father Chrysanthos was swimming during the night in order to go and perform the liturgy and commune the lepers. With the discovery of the antidote against leprosy and the healing of the lepers, who remained alive, the leprosy ended in 1957 on the island. However, Father Chrysanthos remained on the island until 1962 to commemorate the souls of the dead lepers five years after the last of them died. He was the last man on the island. Far from being the source of disease, throughout church history, Thousands upon thousands of faithful have flocked to Holy Communion and the Holy Icons as a safeguard from pandemics, and they have received not only a safeguard, but also miraculous healings. In an article entitled, The Bread, the Wine, the Mode, priest monk Christosimus Kotlomissianos says, 
The recently arrived ancient fear of a pandemic has sparked fruitful discussions among learned ecclesiastical people and theologians around the world. It has been suggested that disease can be transmitted by way of the mode in which Holy Communion is distributed. It has also been argued that the Holy Gifts themselves have the potential to transmit pathogenic microorganisms. The bread as the body of Christ, since it is essentially unchanged and retains its physical properties, is not only susceptible to corruption, but can transmit toxic viruses. Indeed, a Christological basis has been put forward. Christ's human body itself is a carrier of microorganisms that can harm us. After all, they are not evil because there is nothing evil in creation. In this context, the following information can be found in the works of the Holy Fathers and is useful. Of course, there is nothing evil in creation. No form of life, even natural disasters, can be considered evil. Because evil is only that which moves us away from God. But there are the effects of personal sin, such as a dangerous laboratory hybrid, and the effects of the primordial fall, destruction, and death that subjected man. But God's incarnation introduces something new to the world. Let us open a parenthesis to see what we believe about the holy gifts of the Divine Liturgy. Do we believe that they merely symbolize the presence of Christ, as generally is accepted in Protestantism? Are we Protestants? We are indeed Protestants, if we believe that holy bread must be given out in specialized, sterilized sachets, and the precious blood packed with certification. But the Greek fathers talk of a change of the material elements, and that they are not simply a simple symbolic function. This change indicates the new way of existence that God's incarnate manifestation brings. Here we must bear in mind the patristic distinction between the logos of nature and the mode of existence, a distinction useful for an orthodox understanding of the mystery of Christ. This distinction is used by certain fathers to interpret God's miracles in history. When God intervenes to perform a miracle, he does not alter the nature of creation, their logos, but he innovates the mode with which their nature acts in order to fulfill the divine economy. Innovative mode means a nature that works beyond its institution, beyond its limits, shifting man to a different kind of life, such as, for example, Noah, who could remain unharmed among wild beasts, or as the saints who walked on liquid water, like the recently commemorated Mary of Egypt. The culmination of divine intervention is the Incarnation. The mystery that occurs in the Incarnate Logos is the indivisible union of divine and human nature. This union means that the property of one nature becomes the property of the other, as when a sword joining fire becomes fire, and at the same time the fire acquires a blade. Human nature remains intact, and its mode is renewed. This is why Christ is born both in a divine manner and in a human manner. For example, he is conceived by a mother, but without corruption and pain. He did not submit to nature, he did not abolish it, but he turned it into another mystery. Christ's human nature acts in a divine manner, and it acts in a divine manner because it holds the fullness of the uncreated divine energy. This also applies to the interpretation of divine Eucharist. Here too, the nature of the material elements, bread and wine, is innovated. 
their logos, substance, and their physical properties do not change, but their mode is changed. Just as in Christ, everything human in him has a supernatural mode, since his human nature carries all the energy of the divinity. So the material gifts receive and impart to the participants the same divine human energy of Christ. We therefore commune, not something subject to corruption and death, but God himself, through the matter that becomes life-giving, as the flesh of Christ itself is life-giving. True communion, of course, is not only about the presence of Christ in the bread and the wine, but also about the presence of Christ in us. Union with God is not acted upon without the free will and the synergy of man, nor exclusively through the divine Eucharist. Man must follow and imitate Christ freely and be born in the Spirit. Divine energy acts in many ways according to the faith and desire of the one who receives. So, when Christ is offered as bread, he does not change the substance of the bread, but exercises economy. Christ's human nature was passable, yet it was one with the divinity, which is why he could not be held by death. And as his body died and was resurrected, since the divinity never abandoned it, so we too, when we receive the bread body, we foretaste resurrection. Just as Christ suffers as a human being and acts as God, so the bread Christ can suffer, but acts in us as an uncreated divinity. As St. Cyril of Alexandria explains, The body of Christ is holy and has the power to defeat any disease. It was and is holy not simply as flesh with its physical attributes, but as a temple of the God of word inhabiting it, who sanctifies the flesh with his spirit. That is why Christ, too, gives life to the daughter of the leader of the synagogue, not only with his almighty command, but also with the touch of his body. This is why, in those who receive Holy Communion with faith and true repentance, the body of the Lord becomes a safeguard for the strength and healing and health of soul and body, preservation and theosis of human nature. The sanctified gifts act as the divinized body of Jesus. Even through matter, God gives life incorruptible. And although human incorruptibility is an eschatological condition, and we will all sooner or later pass to the opposite shore, the doses of incorruptibility are given in this mortal life, according to the faith, the desire, the godly fear, and the love of everyone. Let us now explore what the Holy Fathers have said regarding the sanctified gifts. St. Ignatius of Antioch says, I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David. And for a drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins, and which that Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. St. Justin the Martyr says, We call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it, 
except one who believes our teaching to be true and who has been washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration, for example, has received baptism, and he is thereby living as Christ enjoined. For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these, but since Jesus Christ our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God, and had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him, and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nurtured, is both the flesh and the blood of that incarnated Jesus. St. Irenaeus of Lyon says, If the Lord were from other than the Father, how could he rightly take bread, which is of the same creation as our own, and confess it to be his body, and affirm that the mixture in the cup is his blood? He has declared the cup a part of creation, to be his own blood, from which he causes our blood to flow, and the bread a part of creation. He has established as his own body, which from which he gives increase unto our bodies. When, therefore, the mixed cup, wine and water, and the baked bread receives the word of God and becomes the Eucharist, the body of Christ, and from these the substance of our flesh is increased and supported, How can they say that the flesh is not capable of receiving the gift of God, which is eternal life, flesh which is nourished by the body and blood of the Lord and is in fact a member of him? St. Clement of Alexandria says, Eat my flesh. Jesus says, And drink my blood. The Lord supplies us with these intimate nutrients. He delivers over his flesh and pours out his blood, and nothing is lacking for the growth of his children. St. Cyprian of Carthage says he, Paul, threatens, moreover, the stubborn and forward, and denounces them, saying, Whosoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. All these warnings, being scorned and condemned, contemned, lapsed Christians will often take communion, before their sin is expiated, before confession has been made of their crime, before their conscience has been purged by sacrifice and by the hand of the priest, before the offense of an angry and threatening Lord has been appeased, and so violence is done to his body and blood, and they sin now against their Lord, more with their hand and mouth than when they denied their Lord. Aphrahat the Persian sage says, After having spoken thus at the Last Supper, the Lord rose up from the place where he had made the Passover and had given his body as food and his blood as drink, and he went with his disciples to the place where he was to be arrested. But he ate of his own body and drank of his own blood while he was pondering on the dead. With his own hands, the Lord presented his own body to be eaten, and before he was crucified, he gave his blood as drink. St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, The bread and the wine of the Eucharist, before the holy invocation of the adorable Trinity, were simple bread and wine. But the invocation having been made, the bread becomes the body of Christ, and the wine, the blood of Christ. Do not, therefore, regard the bread and wine as simply that, for they are, according to the Master's declaration, the body and blood of Christ, 
even though the senses suggest to you the other, let faith make you firm. Do not judge in this matter by taste, but be fully assured by the faith, not doubting that you have been deemed worthy of the body and blood of Christ, since you are fully convinced that the apparent bread is not bread, even though it is sensible to the taste, but the body of Christ, and that the apparent wine is not wine, even though the taste would have it so. Partake of that bread as something spiritual, and put a cheerful face on your soul. St. Ambrose of Milan says, Perhaps you may be saying, I see something else. How can you assure me that I am receiving the body of Christ? It but remains for us to prove it. And how many are the examples we might use? Christ is in that sacrament because it is the body of Christ. Finally, from the Council of Ephesus, we read, We will necessarily add this also, proclaiming the death according to the flesh of the only begotten Son of God, that is, Jesus Christ, confessing his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven, we offer the unbloody sacrifice in the churches, and so go on to the mystical thanksgivings, and are sanctified, having received his holy flesh and the precious blood of Christ the Savior of us all. And not as common flesh do we receive it, God forbid, nor as of a man sanctified and associated with the word according to the unity of worth, or as having a divine indwelling, but as truly the life-giving and very flesh of the Word Himself. For He is the life according to His nature as God, and when He became united to His flesh, He made it also to be life-giving. Let us take the mask off from our soul and stop doubting. Let us start taking our repentance seriously. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.